Hello, Dark Reader, and welcome to the Dark Side of the Library podcast. I'm your host, Katie. On this mini-sode today, we will be talking about the book called The Cloisters. This book came out in November of last year, so it wasn't that long ago, but the year's going by so fast, I'm like, oh my god, I'm falling behind on my TBR, I feel like. So anyway, the author of this book is Katie Hayes, and let's talk about her real fast, and then we'll do a summary and my thoughts on this book. Just a forewarning, uh... I gave this book a one out of five, (laughs) so um, if you don't want anything to be spoiled and whatnot, I would probably pause this podcast, or if you just don't care, then keep watching. I'm also, I might be ranting a little bit, so another warning, if you just don't want to hear it, I totally get that too. So let me talk about Katie Hayes real fast. So she lives in California, she's a writer, she also is an adjacent or helps with Uh, art history teaching at some universities. It's hard to read her bio, I have to be perfectly honest, because it's kind of ambiguous, as is her writing style in general, so it it fits. But anyway, so she uh, has written a lot of actual scholarly books or has contributed to some academic articles and not, you know, not novels, but journals, etc. Um, And this, The Cloisters, is her first debut fiction novel. Granted, it's a whole different ballgame over here, right? That's it about Katie Hayes for me. Here's a bit about The Cloisters. Let's talk about the summary real fast. We have our main protagonist, Anne, who wants to spend the summer in New York, and she wants to work at the Met or the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So instead, though, she gets assigned to the Cloisters, which is, I guess, an adjacent place to the Met. It's not quite the Met, but the Cloisters is kind of this gothic building, and what they specialize in is mostly Renaissance art or art from the medieval time. They have a beautiful collection over there. In fact, this is a place I would love to go. So already, this feels very perfect for me. I'm an artist and I love this whole thing. Anne gets drawn into a very small circle of people who are really charismatic and enigmatic. And um, they all have their own goals, their own secrets, desires, etc. And that includes our museum curator, whose name is Patrick. Patrick is convinced that the history of the tarot is the key to unlocking some mysteries behind fortune telling, current day of fortune telling, hopefully creating some sort of bridge between the two. So Anne is very happy about this, regardless of if she was at the Met or the Cloister. She just wants to leave her own troubled past. She is also an incredible people pleaser. She just wants to fit into this place. She really it just wants to escape her home, maybe find a forever home here, and she tends to just kind of like, yeah, sure, I'll do this thing for you, including with Patrick. He's got all of these crazy theories about the tarot, so she's like, okay, I'll go along with it. But Anne discovers this old 15th century tarot deck, and this becomes the pivotal moment where the whole book becomes a game of kind of like a cat and mouse. There's toxic relationships, lots of mystery, intrigue, murder, etc. So as this whole game is panning out between the small circle of people at the cloisters, Anne has to decide if she is able to defy the cards and shape her own future. What the publisher says here is, bringing together the modern and the arcane, The Cloisters is a rich, thrilling tale told of obsession and ruthless pursuit of power. All right, so I already told you at the very beginning, I gave this book a one out of five. I think on average, this book probably gets about a 3.5 especially on Goodreads, I don't know why this did not hit the mark for me. I'm going to explain why it didn't work for me, but that does not mean it's not going to work for you. Just an FYI, every book hits everybody differently. This one, I was just shocked. I was severely disappointed just because it's totally up my alley. So let's get into it a little bit. Now, I know I kind of did a slight and I said, you know, that Katie Hayes has this really ambiguous way of writing. I I think that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. The way that she writes is very, it just trails off a little bit. There's not nothing too solid. Everything is very, it just feels muddy. 
just it's supposed to entice readers in my opinion but it just doesn't there's a point where you do have to give us something and it has to be a clear picture and I felt like everything was just like everything's all dreamy and in the clouds kind of and even in the setting it just didn't work for me I felt lost most of the time I was like what is even happening all of the different trails the different plot points I was not hooked to anything because there was no clear hook for me, I love mysteries, but this was just, it was too much. So speaking of ambiguous, our main protagonist, Anne. So the one thing we do understand about Anne is that she hates Walla Walla. Now, I live not that far away from Walla Walla, and it's really not that bad over there. She makes it sound like they live in like this bumpkin you know, tiny town, and yes, kind of that's true, but they have this very elaborate liberal arts college there, and they do touch on that as well. But it's interesting because Anne is literally what I would call a Mary Sue. So she can do everything. So she is really miserable in this little town, and she wants to leave, not just her past, but she's got a clingy mom. Uh, she feels like she has no place there um, and no growth. And yet she and that she's in this tiny town and can't, you know, doesn't know the world. And yet she knows seven languages and her parents were professors and they're very well educated. You know, it's just those kind of conflicting points there. I'm just like. And so even with all of those Mary Sue elements, you would think, oh man, she's got to be such an interesting person to read about. She is not. She is so bland. She's the most bland character. And not only that, she might have, she might know seven languages. She might be fairly educated. She might want to, she might be adventurous. In fact, sometimes she's called really punkish. Like she's got kind of an edge to her, but she can't see the people around her, how they're really toxic or they're just really not good people or they they have some strange behavior, she's very oblivious to so many things. This is why she's a Mary Sue. She's got all of the traits at, that anybody could have, but she's bland. She's so bland. Honestly, there was many times where it was super hard to read because I felt like her um, naive behavior was propelling the story forward and it didn't have there would be no narrative there if she wasn't so oblivious and kind of stupid I no offense like she there would be no really anything there there's nothing really overtly magical either about this story I will talk a little further about kind of my issues here because we're led to believe that this is kind of a story about um, the arcane in some fashion, and yet not really. So we'll talk about a little bit that further. We're going to continue on with our characters. There's other characters in the summary that we don't talk about, like Rachel. She's huge in the story. She's the only other person that is working for the curator, Patrick, and she latches on to Anne right away. They become quick, fast friends, even though Rachel is supposed to be this well-known person in the art world. All of the girls who were there meeting up with the curators in the museum at the Met when Anne first arrives, Rachel walks in and they're like, oh my god, is that Rachel? And then Anne's the only one that gets to work with her and Patrick in the cloisters. And even Rachel it is also just not a character. I just didn't really see her appeal. If anything, all of her negative traits were just glaring. They were so in your face. And I didn't really see why everybody was like, oh, it's Rachel. Ah, you know, all that stuff. We also have two other characters that we talk a lot about, which is uh, our gardener at the Cloisters, Leo. And we also have Patrick. So Patrick is a pretty standard I don't know. He was so forgettable um, in my, oh God, I feel horrible saying that, but he really was kind of forgettable. I actually forgot about his name. I thought his name was Paul and then I had to reread it again. I was like, oh, it's Patrick. That's right. So Patrick is pretty much just a standard 
guy in academia, he is really into his research. He's obsessive. He wants to learn more about the tarot and he's willing to do whatever it takes to do that. And then we have Leo, who's our gardener, who's like, I'm chill with this, but he also wants to be a playwright. And Leo and Anne have this whirlwind romance, but not really. She keeps saying, oh, it's it's not serious. Leo's kind of like a palate cleanser because the whole book can come off really pretentious. And then we have Leo who's like, oh, these guys are just, they're art guys and they're really obsessed with their art and you just have to live, man. He's that kind of character. All of this to say, I did not find really any of the characters, even though I actually would rather hang out with Leo and I definitely relate to Leo more. I just still feel like everybody was really bland and almost a, just a big trope, a big tropey character in a, not a, the best way either, just over the top, a little ridiculous. We see that the summary talks about how the book is supposed to talk a lot about the arcane. It's supposed to be gothic atmospheric. Um, it's supposed to be a thriller. It's supposed to have some creep factor to it. I got none of those things. So we have this peak in the book where Anne finds these tarot cards and you would think that this is the time where we're going to be talking more about the magical elements and maybe there's some supernatural forces going on. Not at all. That does not happen whatsoever. We talk a lot in the book about fate. Uh, can you control fate? Can you change it? She does talk th about the Moira a lot, so the, the different fates in Greek mythology and just like their roles in fate, Greek mythology, what they do with the string, um, and how that relates to Anne. But all of that just seemed so dry, and it was a bit of a slog, and it didn't really, I feel like, have a purpose other than we're talking about tarot cards and fate. It just almost was like this weird philosophical diatribe that would happen every once in a while throughout the book. Speaking of dry, this book is so long and it drags on. It I, it really does. It doesn't start picking up until three quarters of the book. Everything else in the novel was basically talking about the fates and the cards, um, which I don't feel like that lends to the book being, oh, this is now a gothic book because we talk about tarot cards. It almost feels like just you have to have this very big appreciation for classical renaissance medieval art and just there's so many things about the art and the art world the met um and just art academia it almost felt very pretentious and it just it wasn't easy to read and i am an artist so it was and these are places i'd love to visit these are places it would be amazing to work at and study, etc. But even I was just like, I don't, what is happening here? I came here for a gothic, atmospheric, creepy book. I personally did not find anything scary, horror related. I did not even find any of the atmosphere creepy. And I don't think that's just me. I think there was too much reliance on the fact that we are talking about an actual place, the cloisters, and there wasn't as much of leaning into describing the architecture and how that makes Anne feel and how that is ascribed to the tarot cards and fate and the creepy looming doom, the obsessive behavior we see with Patrick, some of the weird stuff. It just didn't feel that creepy, even though there it was the perfect atmosphere. It was the perfect atmosphere for it. So the characters were bland. I felt like the plot was really ambiguous. I didn't find myself really caring much about anything. In fact, I wasn't really sure what was happening. For the first half of the book, it was mostly about Anne wanting to leave Walla Walla so desperately running away from her tragic past and these things with her father her father passed away and just wanting to really embrace art culture and learn more and go you know explore the world and new york is the place to go at this bustling city that was what was happening for the first half of the book and it felt so long to get to the actual hook and the hook wasn't even that much. I felt like I was waiting for something to happen for so long. And I, f 
it was a huge letdown. And if you have listened to some of our previous podcast episodes, you know that I don't care if things are very predictable. In fact, there's been plenty of books that I've thoroughly enjoyed. I guess the plot, and it really doesn't matter. We We've kind of used up a lot of the same plot points. Uh, there's a reason why there's a certain way that we write so that it makes sense. But this one, I guessed what the plot was right away, even though I was I was kind of hoping it wasn't what I was going to guess. And it was a huge letdown, and it wasn't done well, in my opinion. The twists and turns did not feel very... It just didn't do much for me. And to top it off, how the story kind of wraps up, it felt like Katie Hayes actually didn't know how to end the book. In fact, just the last couple sentences of the novel, which I won't reveal, it honestly felt like, all right, we're done. <laughs> I was like, okay, really? That's what's happening? We're, we're just, okay. <sighs> So I will stop here with my ranting because I could go on forever and my ADHD, the more I think about it, the more things are starting to pop up. So I'm just going to leave it here. I personally did not find this book as appealing as I had hoped and it probably, I was excited. I, it had a lot of hype behind it and it felt like it was going to be perfect down my alley and it really wasn't. So it's a one out of five for me. But I hope that other people are enjoying it. Honestly, I really, really do. And let me know what your thoughts are on the book. I'd love to hear about it. I might have just missed something because um, that does happen. I'm not perfect. So make sure to give us a comment. Let us know what you think of The Cloisters by Katie Hayes. If you are looking for some spooky reads, make sure to stay tuned every Wednesday and Friday, especially as most of us are going to be going on some vacations, hanging by lakes or pools or wherever you are, reading books. There are some really great dark reads that are perfect for summertime. I mean, obviously, like, I know what you did last summer, but there's a whole bunch of other books out there, supernatural books. There's kids' books. YA, there's even nonfiction books that are really fun to read during the summertime. So make sure to stay tuned uh, for those days and learn about some books that are going to be released this year. You can also join us on our socials at Dark Side of the Library on Facebook, Instagram, and of course YouTube. You might be here. If not, go over on our podcast and you can listen to us uh, over there on your long summer road trips. Be sure to let your friends, family know about this podcast. It really helps us out, and we appreciate you so much. Thank you again. We will see you next time. Have a creeptastic week.